This is Mazda CX-30 and judging by the name, Mazda wasn't even planning to make this model. In the mid noughties of the 21st century, Mazda replaced its MPV called MPV and its tribute SUV based on the Ford Escape with the CX-9 and CX-7 crossovers. Both models were powered by large, at least by European standards, engines and therefore never really gained traction on the old continent. This is when Mazda decided to axe the CX-7 and replace it with revolutionary CX-5. During the months preceding the launch of the CX-5 in 2012, Mazda presented its new crossover as the greatest thing ever since the invention of sliced bread. From that point of view, the media who expected an MX-5 SUV were somewhat disappointed. But judging by the sales figures, Mazda hit bullseye. In some markets, CX-5 sells as well as the Toyota RAV4. Sure, the CX-5 is far behind the RAV4 in the US, but in Europe both models have similar sales and they are both far behind the slightly smaller Tiguan, which it seems like Volkswagen can't make enough of. So this means there is a place for a crossover between the CX-5 and the CX-3. Why not CX-4? Initially I assumed it's got to do with the platform which the CX-30 shares with the current Mazda 3, but it turns out there is simply a CX-4 in China. Something between a Mazda 6 and a CX-5. Bar trivia. Perhaps Mazda product gurus really never assumed that there may come a time when crossovers in every segment will sell like hotcakes. What sort of an idiot would waste time and money to design the T-Rock, the T-Cross, the Tiguan? Oh, wait. So now that we know what Mazda CX-30 is for, let's see if it can conquer what in Europe is the Tiguan territory. First and foremost, Mazda cut the premium brand BS. In a 35-page long press release, the word premium is used only four times, mainly regarding the premium Bose audio. The Mazda CX-30 interior resembles that of Mazda 3, but the visibility is obviously much better and there is much more light in the cabin. This is a high-spec model, so it has seats with electric adjustment and memory function. These seats are very comfortable, however I recall that the standard seats in Mazda 3 had less adjustment and they were less comfortable. You may want to verify that during a longer test drive. Mazda CX-30 gets the new version of the MZD Connect infotainment system, something the current CX-5 badly needs. There is almost a 9-inch screen, not a touch screen. This is for ergonomic reasons, you would have to lean forward to actually reach it. So everything is operated with a dial, rotary dial. General navigation is like one in of the past versions of BMW iDrive, one which still doesn't require a PhD to operate. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come as standard. In Mazda 3, launching Satnav on your phone cut off traffic sign recognition. When I brought it up with a Mazda representative, I was told the issue is known to Mazda and it should be rectified in one of the upcoming software updates. So, has it been rectified? No. But that doesn't matter because Satnav is still too slow around roundabouts and the traffic sign recognition gets the speed wrong when you pass an exit on the motorway. Like in the Mazda 3, also here you can set the front camera to turn on every time you start the car. It's useful, for example, if you always park the car backwards and you need the front camera to exit safely. Regardless of the spec, Mazda CX-30 gets reversing cross-traffic alert. In higher trims, it's also combined with automatic braking. Placement of buttons and storage is sensible, everything is within reach and everything is pleasant to touch. The glove box and storage under the armrest are okay size and so are the door pockets. 
The cockpit is not as well laid out as in the larger Honda CRV, but better than in Peugeot 3008 and Citroen C5 Aircross, both of which are more pleasing to the eye, in my opinion. What's under the bonnet? I came here hoping to test out Mazda's new Skyactiv X engine, which Mazda has been raving about for months. However, it seems that the engine is so advanced, Mazda is still ironing out some details and I will only be able to drive a pre-production car for a while. In car journalist lingo, pre-production stands for if something doesn't work, don't blame us because we're still working on it. Meanwhile, I'm driving the 122 horsepower 2 liter Skyactiv G. If you're an American, you don't care, but if you're from Europe, let's pause here and appreciate the fact that Mazda's base engine is still a normally aspirated 2 liters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For you Americans out there, here in Europe, base engines and crossovers include a 1.5 liter in the Tiguan, 1.3 liter in the Qashqai, 1.2 liter in the CHR, and 1.0 in the T Rock. So, 2 liters is a huge deal. 2 liters or not, a speed demon it ain't, but I don't expect people choose family crossovers to do rally stages in them. That said, 0 to 100 kilometers per hour is dealt with in high tens, so nothing to write home about. This engine is a so-called mild hybrid. A mild hybrid uses kinetic energy recuperated during braking to power the onboard electronics, including stop and start system. It gives you some boost upon a hard acceleration and it also helps fuel efficiency. Here there is a 24 volt system rather than a 48 volt one. Mazda explains this is enough to power whatever there is to power and it's lighter and cheaper. The Skyactiv G engine has cylinder deactivation technology. Two out of four cylinders can be shut down when driving at a constant speed. In Mazda 3, I felt some vibration when the engine was running on two cylinders. It was especially obvious with the manual gearbox, slightly less so with the automatic. The car I'm driving here is a six-speed automatic and there are no noticeable vibrations during cylinder deactivation. Fuel economy. Mazda promises around 7 liters per 100 kilometers combined for the automatic model, slightly below with front-wheel drive, slightly above with all-wheel drive. This is a front-wheel drive, by the way. During a press launch event, when we stop a lot to film, the results are skewed, but just so you know, after about 150 kilometers, the computer is showing 7 liters and a bit per 100 kilometers, so it's well within reason. Like in the Mazda 3, also the CX-30 has a twist beam in the back. Mazda explains a strategic decision has been made to base the model range on two platforms. Everything compact and below gets a twist beam and the larger cars get independent suspension. Handling is okay as long as you don't push the car too far. If you do, it turns out that the engine is out of breath pretty much all of the time and whoa, fast corners are not its forte. You can feel the twist beam working too much to call it fun. I would like to stress here that in order to feel what I just described, you'd have to drive very irresponsibly and the CX-30 is just not made for that, so don't. On the plus side, the sound insulation is superb and so is damping. The suspension is really, really okay. If I had to sum up the CX-30 in a few words, I'd say it's a car designed more with comfort than sporty driving in mind. Oh, and by the way, the brakes on this thing, they're also very, very effective. Bite right from the top. Whoa! Space in the back is okay. It's not great, not terrible. I'll be saying this in every episode now. Anyway, there is no 12 volt socket, no USB ports, but at least there are two air vents and one pocket here behind the passenger, not behind the driver. There are a couple of cup holders in the armrest and a place for a bottle in the door bins. 
unfortunately I will have to show you bottles in cutaways because when we stopped here and the nice gentleman went to clean the car they took our water bottles with them and we need to get new ones just for video At 430 liters, the boot is somewhat larger than in the Tiguan and much smaller than in a Peugeot 3008. There is a load lip and, surprise, no 12 volt socket. There are also no handles to release the backrests, which, by the way, split 60-40. Besides the base model, all cars get electrically operated tailgate and there is a button to lock the car as well. What is it with Japanese car companies and long closing tailgates? It's not as bad as in the RAV4, but still. And now let's take a ride in the Skyactiv X Mazda CX-30. This is a completely new design. The engine also has a mild hybrid, but no cylinder deactivation. Good morning and welcome to the Mazda CX-30 Skyactiv X. I had to get up very early to get my hands on one. And here I am in it. And um, okay, the Skyactiv X, it's so advanced, I will be talking to an expert in about half an hour so that he can tell me what it's all about. Meanwhile, I can tell you that from my experience so far with the engine, it's obviously much more dynamic than the Skyactiv G. It's about 60 horsepower more, obviously, but what's really interesting in this engine is that uh, it's got a lot more grunt down low, so you don't have to rev it high to get it going. You can just uh, use the torque in the more usable everyday rev band so we're talking two to four thousand rpm rather than four to six of course if you push it really hard it will go into high rpms like uh, other petrol engines and up there around five and a half six thousand rpm not much is happening unfortunately however it does feel much more agile and much more flexible and much more usable in everyday situation. Speaking of uh, everyday situations, what's the fuel consumption on this thing? Again, this is a very short test loop, but so far I've been averaging about seven and a half liters per 100 kilometers when not pushing it hard. And the tendency is rather going down than up. If you push it, obviously you're going to achieve uh, over eight liters per 100 kilometers, but under normal circumstances, it will do seven thereabouts so it does seem like an economical choice and uh, if you want to have a car that's a bit more usable a bit more punchy if you carry a lot of people because this is going to be important uh, you may want to choose this engine however don't think that the cx30 with this engine is all of a sudden a more fun car to drive fast i wouldn't say that uh, even with the G vectoring, which again, according to Mazda is cat's whiskers, even with the G vectoring, this car is not very good around fast corners. I think it's just to do with the uh, twist beam rear suspension. It's just not as advanced and it's just not as good for doing such uh, such high speed maneuvers so this car i would definitely stand by my earlier statement it's more about comfort and everyday usability than driving fun which is well driving fun was something that mazda was always associated with but then driving fun doesn't sell as well as 
everyday comfort. To find out more about the Skyactiv X technology, I talked to Christian Schulze, Director of Technology Research and Technical Regulation Compliance at Mazda Motor Europe R&D. For Skyactiv G, we have already introduced a very high compression ratio. That means we compress the air fuel mixture a lot to have more efficient burning. For the Skyactiv X, we have a now started an additional measure. We are using a very lean mixture. That means we're using a lot of air in comparison to a little bit of fuel. This makes the combustion very efficient. The problem is such a fuel cannot be ignited directly by a spark plug. And that's why we need compression ignition. This has never been possible to control the compression ignition. And what we do now is we compress this lean mixture and then we use an additional very small fuel amount which we explode by a spark plug to create a pressure wave inside of the cylinder. And this pressure wave runs like a tsunami through the cylinder and then ignites all the rest. This is a way how we can really control this compression ignition and achieve a very, very high efficiency. As we now bring so much air into the engine, we have a very wide open throttle. So this engine breathes very easily that means the reaction to acceleration commands through the throttle are very direct and very responsive. So this engine is really very agile. And there is one more reason why you may want to choose Skyactiv X over Skyactiv G, and that's the cylinder deactivation technology, which the G has and the X doesn't. When the two cylinders deactivate in the Skyactiv G, which I'm driving right now, there is this unpleasant vibration like I noticed in the Mazda 3. Yeah. Prices of the Mazda CX-30 start at 24,290 euro for a 122 horsepower manual front-wheel drive car, add 2,000 for an automatic gearbox or better save it for something else because it's crap especially with the base engine. In some markets the CX-30 is also available with a 1.8 diesel engine the 180 horsepower Skyactiv X will cost you at least 27,000 euro. Taking standard equipment into account, Mazda CX-30 sounds like a good deal, although cars in general are becoming ridiculously expensive, and Mazda is no exception here. Mazda CX-30 is a much more mature project than the Mazda 3. It's going to sell because people seem to like crossovers. Why? Well, maybe you can tell me in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to subscribe, rate this video and share it with your friends. And hit the notification bell so you get, uh, you know, notified whenever I post a new video. Usually I post on Fridays unless it's a premiere like this one here. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one. It is probably not so easy to change it to LPG, but I think basically it would be possible, but it requires engineering work.